Evil Deeds at Red Cougar, Robert Irvin Howard. I've been accused of prejudice in the town of Red Cougar, on account of my habit of avoiding it if I have to ride 50 miles out in my way to keep from going through the... I denies the slander. It ain't no more prejudiced for me to ride around Red Cougar than it is for a lobo to keep his paw out of a jump trap. My experiences in that the layer of iniquity is painful to recall. I was a stranger and took in. I was a sheep for the fleecing, and if some of the fleeces got their fingers catched in the shears, it was their own fault. If I shuns Red Cougar like a plague, that makes it mutual, because the inhabitants of Red Cougar shuns me with equal enthusiasm, even to the pint of deserting their wagons and taking to the brush if they happen to meet me on the road, I weren't intending to go there in the first place. I've been punching cows over in Utah and was heading for Bear Creek, with the fifty bucks a draw poker game had left me out of my wages. When I seen a trail branching off of the main road I knowed it turned off to Red Cougar, but it didn't make no impression on me, but I hadn't gone far past it when I heard a horse running, and the next thing it busted around a bend in the road with foam flying from the bit rings. There was a gal on it, looking back over her shoulder down the road. Just as she rounded the turn her hoss stumbled and went to its knees, throwing her over its head. I was off a camp kid in an instant and catched her hoss before it could run off. I helped her up, and she grabbed hold of me and hollered, Don't let him get me, who? I said, taking off my hat with one hand and drawing a point four five with the other, a gang of desperados. She panted. They've chased me for five miles. Oh, please don't let him get me. They'll take you only over my dead carcass, I assured her, she gave me a look, which made my heart turn somersets. She had black curly hair and big innocent grey eyes, and she was the prettiest gal I'd saw in a coon's age, oh, thank you. She panted. I knowed you was a gent the minute I seen you. Will you help me up onto my hoss? You sure you ain't hurt none? I asked, and she said she won't, so I helped her up, and she gathered up her reins and looked back down the road very nervous. Don't let him follow me she begged. I'm going on, you don't need to do that, I says. Wait till I exterminate them scoundrels, and I'll escort you home, but she started convulsively as the distant pound of hooves reached us, and said, oh, I das not. They mustn't even see me again. But I want to, I said. Where you live, Red Cougar, says she. My name's Soup Richard. If you happen up that way, drop in, I'll be there. I promised and she flashed me a dazzling smile and loped on down the road and out of sight up the Red Cougar trail, so I set to work. I uses a rope wove out a buffalo hide, a right smart longer and thicker and stronger than the average rioter because a man my size has got to have a rope to match. I tied said lariat across the road about three foot off the ground, then I backed Cam Kid into the bushes, and pretty soon six men swept around the bend. The first hoss fell over my rope and the others fell over him, and the way they piled up in the road was beautiful to behold. Before you could bat your eye there was a most amazing tangle of kicking horses and cussing men. I chose that instant to ride out at the bresh and throw my pistols down on them, cease that scandalous language and rise with your hands up. I requested, and they done so, but not cheerfully. Some had been kicked right severe by the horses, and one had pitched over his KU's neck and lit on his head, and his conversation worn in our ways sensible, what's the meaning of this here hold up? Demanded a tall maverick with long yellow whiskers, shut up. I told him sternly. Men which chases a hapless gal like a pack of injuns ain't fit in for to talk to a white man, oh, so that's it. Says he. Well, let me tell you, I said shut up. I roared, emphasizing my request by shooting the left tip off of his mustache. I don't aim to powwow with no dern women chasing coyotes. In my country we decorate a live oak with your carcasses, but you don't began one of the others, but yellow whiskers profanely told him to shut up. Don't you see he's one of Ridgeway's men? Snarled he. He's got the drop on us, but our turn'll come. Till it does, save your breath, that's good advice, I says. Unbuckle your gun belts and hang em on your saddle horns, and keep your hands away from them guns whilst you does it. I'd plumb welcome a excuse to salivate the whole mob of you, so they done it, and then I fired a few shots under the hosses' feet and stampeded em, and they run off down the road the direction they'd come from. Yalla Whiskers and his pals cussed something terrible. Better save your wind, I advised em. You likely got a good long walk ahead of you, before you catches your kayas. I'll have your heart's blood for this, raved Yalla Whiskers. I'll have your scalp if I have to trail you from here to Judgment Day. You don't know who you're a monkey in with, and I don't care. I snorted. Vamoose, they'd taken out down the road after their hosses, and I shot around their feet a few times to kinda speed em on their way. 
they disappeared down the road in a faint blue haze of profanity, and I turned around and headed for Red Cougar. I hoped to catch up with Miss Pritchard before she got to Red Cougar, but she had too good a start and was going at too fast a gait. My heart pounded at the thought of her and my corns began to ache. It sure was love at first sight. Well, I'd followed the trail for maybe three miles when I heard guns banging ahead of me. A little bit later I came to where the trail forked and I didn't know which led to Red Cougar. Whilst I was setting the wondering which branch to take, I heard horses running again, and pretty soon a couple of men hove in sight, spurring hard and bending low like they was expecting to be shot from behind. When they approached me I seen they had badges onto their vests, and bullet holes in their hats, which is the road to Red Cougar. I asked politely, Vatten, says the older fella, pinting back the way they'd come. But if you're aiming to go there I advises you to reflect deeply on the matter. Ponder, young man, ponder and meditate. Life is sweet, after all, what you mean? I asked. Who are you all chasing, chasing hell? Says he, polishing his sheriff's badge with his sleeve. We've been chased. Buckridge ways in town, never heard of him, I says. Well, says the sheriff, Buck don't like strangers no more than he does law officers. And you see how well he likes them, this here's a free country. I snorted. When I stays out of town on account of this here Ridgeway or anybody else they'll be ice in hell thick enough for the devil to skate on. I'm going to visit a young lady Miss Soup Richard. Can you tell me where she lives? They looked at me very peculiar, and the sheriff says, Oh, in that case well, she lives in the last cabin north of the general store, on the left hand side of the street, let's get going, urged his deputy nervously. They may follow us. They started spurring again and as they rode off, I heard the deputy say, reckon he's one of them? And the sheriff said, if he ain't he's the biggest damn fool that ever lived, to come spark in soup Richard then they rode out a hearing. I wondered who they was talking about, but soon forgot it as I rode on into Red Cougar, I come in on the south end of the town, and it was about like all them little mountain villages. One straggling street, hound dogs sleeping in the dust of the wagon ruts, and a general store and a couple of saloons. I seen some horses tied at the hitching rack outside the biggest saloon which said Max Bar on it, but I didn't see nobody on the streets, although noises of hilarity was coming out of the saloon. I was thirsty and dusty, and I decided I better have me a drink and spruce up some before I called on Miss Pritchard. So I watered Can Kid at the trough, and tied him to a tree, if I tied him to the hitch rack he'd have kicked the tower out to the other horses, and went into the saloon. They weren't nobody in the butter old coot with grey whiskers standing bar and the noise was all coming from another room. From the racket I judged there was a bowling alley in there and the gents was bowling. I beat the dust out of my pants with my hat and called for whiskey. Whilst I was drinking it the fella said, Stranger in town, hey? I said I was and he said, Friend of Buck Ridgeways, never seen him in my life, says I, and he says, Then you better get out of town fast as you can dust it. Him and his bunch ain't here he pulled out just a little while ago but Jeff Middleton's in there, and Jeff's plenty bad. I started to tell him I weren't studying Jeff Middleton, but just then a lot of whooping bust out in the bowling alley like somebody had made a ten strike or something, and here come six men busting into the bar whooping and yelling and slapping one of them on the back, decorate the mahogany, McVeigh. They whooped. Jeff's bu iron. He just beat Tom Grissom here six straight games, they surged up to the bar and one of them tried to jostle me aside, but as nobody ain't been able to do that successful since I got my full growth. All he done was sprain his elbow. This seemed to irritate him. Because he turned around and said heatedly, What the hell you think you're doing? I'm drinking me a glass of corn squeezins, I replied coldly, and they all turned around and looked at me, and they moved back from the bar and hitched at their pistol belts. There was a hard looking gang, and the fellow they called Middleton was the hardest looking one of them. Who are you and where do you come from? He demanded, None of your damn business, I replied with a touch of old southern courtesy. He showed his teeth at this and fumbled at his gun belt, Air you trying to start something? He demanded, and I seen McVeigh hide behind a stack of beer cakes, I ain't in the habit of starting trouble, I told him. All I does is end it. I'm in here drinking me a quiet dram when you coyotes come surging and hollering like you was the first critter which ever hit a pin, so you depreciates my talents, hey? He squalled like he was stung to the quick. Maybe you think you could beat me, hey? I ain't yet seen the man which could hold a candle to my game, I replied with my usual modesty, all right. He yelled, grinding his teeth. Come into the alley, and I'll show you some action, you big mountain grizzly, hold on, says McVeigh, sticking his head up from behind the cakes. Be careful, Jeff. 
I believe that. I don't care who he is. Raved Middleton. He has given me a mortal insult. Come on, you, if you got the nerve, you be careful with them insults. I roared menacingly, striding into the alley. I ain't the man to be bulldozed. I was looking back over my shoulder when I shoved the door open with my palm and I probably pushed harder than I intended to, and that's why I tore the door off of the hinges. They all looked kinda startled, and McVeigh gave a despairing squeak, but I went on into the alley and picked up a bowl ball which I brandished in defiance, here's fifty bucks. I says, waving the greenbacks. We puts up fifty each and rolls for five dollars a game. That suits you? I couldn't understand what he said because he just made a noise like a wolf grabbing a beefsteak, but he snatched up a bulldog, and produced ten five dollar bills, so I judged it was agreeable with him, but he had an awful temper, and the longer we played, the madder he got, and when I had beat him five straight games and taken twenty five out of his fifty, the veins stood out purple onto his temples, it's your role, I says, and he throwed his bowl ball down and yelled, blast your soul, I don't like your style, I'm through and I'm ducking down my steak. You gets no more of my money, damn you, why, you cheap-heeled picker. I roared. I thought you was a sport, even if you was a hoss thief, but, don't you call me a hoss thief. He screamed, well, cow thief then, I says. If you are so darn particular. It was at this instant that he lost his head to the pint of pulling a pistol and firing at me pint blank. He would have undoubtedly shot me, too, if I hadn't hit him in the head with my bowl ball just as he fired. His bullet went into the ceiling and his friends began to display their disapproval by throwing pins and bulldogs at me. This irritated me almost beyond control, but I kept my temper and taken a couple of them by the neck and beat their heads together till they was limp. The matter would have ended there, without any villains, but the other three insisted on taking the thing serious, and I defy any man to remain tranquil when three hoss thieves are carving at him with bowies and beating him over the head with ten pins. But I didn't intend to bust the big ceiling lamp. I just hit it by accident with the chair which I knocked one of my enemies stiff with. And it warn't my fault if one of them got blood all over the alley. All I done was break his nose and knock out seven teeth with my fist. How'd I know he was going to fall in the alley and bleed on it? As for that section of wall which got knocked out, all I can say is it's a darned flimsy wall which can be wrecked by throwing a man through it. I thought I'd throw him through a winder until I looked closer and seen it was a hole he busted through the wall. And can I help it if them scallywags blowed holes in the roof till it looked like a sieve trying to shoot me? It wasn't my fault, no how, but when the dust settled and I looked around to see if I'd made a clean sweep, I was just in time to grab the shotgun which old man McVeigh was trying to shoot me through the barroom door with. You ought to be ashamed, I reproved. A man of your age and venerable whiskers, trying to shoot a defenseless stranger in the back. But my bow and alley's wrecked. He wept, tearing the aforesaid whiskers. I'm a ruined man. I sunk my wad in it and now look at it, or, well, I says, it warn't my fault, but I can't ain't see an honest man suffer. Here's seventy-five dollars, all I got, tain't enough, says he, nevertheless making a grab for the dough like a kingfisher diving after a pollywog. Tain't near enough, I'll collect the rest from them coyotes, I says, don't do it. He shuddered. They kill me after you left, I want to do the right thing, I says. I'll work out the rest of it. He looked at me right sharp then, and says, come into the bar. But I seen three of them was coming to, so I hauled them up and told them sternly to tote their friends out to the host trough and bring em to. They done so, kinda wobbling on their feet. They acted like they were still addled in the brains, and McVeigh said it looked to him like Middleton was out for the day, but I told him it was quite common for a man to be like that which has just had a fifteen pound bowling ball split in two over his head, then I went into the bar with McVeigh and he poured out the drinks. Air you in earnest about working out that debt? Says he, sure, I said. I always pays my debts, by fair means or foul, ain't you Breckenridge Elkins? Says he, and when I says I was, he says, I thought I recognized you when them fools was badgering you. Look out for em. That ain't all of em. The whole gang rode into town a hour or so ago and run the sheriff and his deputy out, but Buck didn't stay long. He seen his gal, and then he pulled out for the hills again with four men. There's a couple more besides them you fit hangin' around somewheres. I dunno where, outlaws? I said, and he said, sure. But the local law force ain't strong enough to deal with them, and anyway, most of the folks in town is in cahoots with them, and warns them if officers from outside come after them. They hang out in the hills ordinary, but they come into Red Cougar regular. But never mind them. I was just puttin' you on your guard, 
This is what I want you to do. A month ago I was coming back to Red Cougar with a tidy fortune in gold dust I'd panned back up in the hills, when I was held up and robbed. It warned one of Ridgeway's men, it was Three Fingers Clements, a old lone wolf and the worst killer in these parts. He lives by himself up in the hills and nobody knows where, but I just recent learned by accident. He sent a message by a sheafader and the sheafader got drunk in my saloon and talked. I learned he's still got my gold, and aims to sneak out with it as soon as he's joined by a gang of desperados from Tomahawk. It was then the sheafader was talking in the message too. I can ain't get no help from the sheriff, these outlaws has got him plumb buff followed. I want you to ride up in the hills and get my gold. Of course, if you are scared of him, who said I was scared of him or anybody else? I demanded irritably. Tell me how to get to his hideout and I'm on my way, McVeigh's eyes kinda gleamed, and he says, good boy. Follow the trail that leads out to town to the northwest till you come to Diablo Canyon. Follow it till you come to the fifth branch gulch opening into it on the right. Turn off the trail then and follow the gulch till you come to a big white oak near the left hand wall. Climb up out of the gulch there and head due west up the slope. Pretty soon you'll see a crag like a chimney sticking out above a clump of spruces. At the foot of that crag there's a cave, and Clements is living there. And he's a tough old, it's as good as did, I assured him, and had another drink, and went out and clumb aboard Cap Kid and headed out of town. But as I rode past the last cabin on the left, I suddenly remembered about Soup Richard, and I load three fingers could wait long enough for me to pay my respects on her. Likely she was expecting me and getting nervous and impatient because I was so long coming. So I reined up to the stoop and hailed, and somebody looked at me through a winder. They also appeared to be a rifle muscle trained on me, too, but who could blame folks for being cautious with them Ridgeway coyotes in town? Oh, it's you, said a female voice, and then the door opened and Soup Richard said, light and come in. Did you kill any of them rascals? I'm too soft-hearted for my own good, I says apologetically. I just merely only sent him down the road on foot. But I ain't got time to come in now. I'm on my way up in the mountains to see Three Fingers Clements. I aim to stop on my way back, if it's agreeable with you, Three Fingers Clements, says she in a peculiar voice. Do you know where he is? McVeigh told me, I said. He's got a poke of dust he stole from McVeigh. I'm going after it, she said something under her breath which I must have misunderstood because I was sure Miss Pritchard wouldn't use the word it sounded like, come in just a minute, she begged. You got plenty of time. Come in and have a snort of corn juice. My folks is all visiting and it gets mighty lonesome to a gal. Please come in. Well, I never could resist a pretty gal, so I tied Cam Kid to a stump that looked solid, and went in, and she brung out our old man's jug. It was tolerable liquor. She said she never drunk none, personal. We sat and talked, and there wasn't a doubt we cottoned to each other right spang off. There is some that says that Breckenridge Elkins hind got a lick of sense when it comes to women folks among these been my cousin. Bearfield Buckner but I vow and declare that same is my only weakness, if any, and that likewise it is manly weakness, this Sue Pritchard was plumb sensible I seen. She wasn't one of these flighty kind that a fellow would have to court with a banjo or jeter. We talked around about bear traps and what was the best length barrel on shotguns and similar subjects of like nature. I likewise told her one or two of my mild experiences and her eyes boojured big as saucers. We finally got around to my latest encounter. Tell me some more about Three Fingers, she coaxed. I didn't know anybody notice hideout. So I told her what all McVeigh said, and she was a heap interested, and had me repeat the instructions how to get the two or three times. Then she asked me if I'd met any bad men in town, and I told her I'd met six and there was now recovering on pallets in the back of the general store. She looked startled at this, and pretty soon she asked me to excuse her because she heard one of the neighbor women calling her. I didn't hear nobody, but I said all right and she went out of the back door, and I heard her whistle three times. I sat there and had another snort or so and reflected that the girl was undoubtedly taken with me, she was gone quite a spell, and finally I got up and looked out the back window and seen her standing down by the corral talking to a couple of fellas. As I looked one of them got on a bobtailed roan and headed north at a high run, and t'other them come on back to the cabin with Sue, this here's my cousin Jack Montgomery, says she. He wants to go with you. He's just a boy, and likes excitement. He was about the hardest looking boy I ever seen, and he seemed remarkable mature for his years, but I said, all right. But we got to get going, be careful, Breckenridge, she advised. You, too, Jack, 
I won't hurt three fingers no more I got to, I promised her, and we went on our way yonderly, headed for the hideout, we got to Diablo Canyon in about an hour, and went up it about three miles till we come to the gulch mouth McVeigh had described. All to ons Jack Montgomery pulled up and pinted down at a pool we was passing in a holler of the rock, and hollered, look there. Gold dust scattered at the edge of the water, I don't see none, I says, light, he urged, getting off his cayuse. I see it. It's thick as butter along the edge. Well, I got down and bent over the pool but I couldn't see nothing and all to ons something hit me in the back of the head and knocked my hat off. I turned around and seen Jack Montgomery holding the bent barrel of a Winchester carbine in his hands. The stock was busted off and pieces was laying on the ground. He looked awful surprised about something, his eyes was wild and his hair stood up. Are you sick? I asked. What you want to hit me for, you ain't human. He gasped, dropping the bent barrel and jerking out his pistol. I grabbed him and taken it away from him. What's the matter with you? I demanded. Are you locoed? For answer he ran off down the canyon shrieking like a lost soul. I decided he must have went crazy like Sheffaders does sometimes, so I pursued him and catched him. He fit and hollered like a painter, stop that. I told him sternly. I'm your friend. It's my duty to your cousin to see that you don't come to no harm, cousin, hell. Says he with frightful profanity. She ain't no more my cousin than you be, poor fella, I sighed, throwing him on his belly and reaching for his lariat. You're out of your head and suffering from hallucinations. I know the sheaf are just like you unst, only he thought he was sitting bull, what you doing? He hollered, as I started tying him with his rope, don't you worry, I soothed him. I can't let you go tearing around over these mountains in your condition. I'll fix you so's you'll be safe and comfortable till I get back from Three Fingers Cave. Then I'll take you to Red Cougar and we'll send you to some nice, quiet insane asylum, blast your soul. He shrieked. I'm sane as you be. A damn sight saner, because no man with a normal brain could ignore getting a rifle stock broke off over his skull like you done, whereupon he tries to kick me between the eyes and otherwise give evidence of what I once said heard a doctor call his derangement. It was a pitiful sight to see, especially since he was a cousin to Miss Sue Pritchard and would undoubtedly be my cousin-in-law one of these days. He jerked and wrestled and some of his words was downright shocking, but I didn't pay no attention to his ravings. I always heard the way to get along with crazy people was to humor him. I was afeard if I left him laying on the ground the wolves might chaw him, so I tied him up in the crotch of a big tree where they couldn't reach him. I likewise tied his hoss by the pool where it could drink and graze, listen. Jack begged as I clumb onto camp kid. I gave up. Auntie me and I'll spill the bins. I'll tell you everything, you just take it easy, I soothed. I'll be back soon, dollar hash percent and at. Says he, frothing slightly at the mouth. With a sigh of pity I turned up the gulch, and his language till I was clean out a sight ain't to be repeated. A mile or so on I come to the white oak tree, and clumb out of the gulch and went up a long slope till I seen a jut of rock like a chimney rising above the trees. I slid off a cap kid and drawed my pistols and snuck for ud through the thick brush till I seen the mouth of a cave ahead of me. And I also seen something else, too. A man was laying in front of it with his head in a pool of blood. I rolled him over and he was still alive. His scalp was cut open, but the bone didn't seem to be caved in. He was a lanky old coot, with reddish-gray whiskers, and he didn't have but three fingers onto his left hand. There was a pack tore up and scattered on the ground nigh him, but I reckoned the pack mule had run off. There was also hoss tracks leading west. There was a spring nearby and I'd brung my hat full of water and sloshed it into his face, and tried to pour some into his mouth, but it warn't no go. When I throwed the water over him he kinda twitched and groaned. But when I tried to pour the water down his gullet he kinda instinctively clamped his jaws together like a bulldog, then I seen a jug setting in the cave, so I brung it out and pulled out the cork. When it popped he opened his mouth convulsively and reached out his hand, so I poured a pint or so down his gullet, and he opened his eyes and glared wildly around till he seen his busted pack, and then he clutched his whiskers and shrieked, they got it. My poke of dust. I been hiding up here for weeks, and just when I was going to make a jump for it. They finds me, who? I asked, Buckeridge Way and his gang. He squalled. I was earless. When I heard horses I thought it was the men which was coming to help me take my gold out. Next thing I knowed Ridgeway's bunch had run out of the brush and was beating me over the head with their colts. I'm a rude man, hell's fire. Quoth I with passion. Them Ridgeways was beginning to get on my nerves. I left old man Clements howling his woes to the skies like a timber wolf with a bellyache 
and I forked Cam Kid and headed west. They left to trail the youngest kid on Bear Creek could follow. IT led for five miles through as wild a country as I ever seen outside the Humboldts, and then I seen a cabin ahead, on a wide benchland and that back taken a steep mountain slope. I could just see the chimney through the tops of a dense thicket. It wasn't long till sundown and smoke was coming out of the chimney, I knowed it must be the Ridgeway hideout, so I went busting through the thicket in such a hurry that I forgot they might have a man on the lookout. I'm powerful absent-minded that away. There was one all right, but I was coming so fast he missed me with his buffalo gun, and he didn't stop to reload but run into the cabin yelling, bar the door quick. Here comes the biggest man in the world on the biggest hoss in creation, they done so. When I emerged from amongst the trees they opened up on me through the loopholes with sawed off shotguns. If it had been Winchesters I'd have ignored them, but even I'm a little bashful about buckshot at close range, when six men is shooting at me all to onst. So I retired behind a big tree and begun to shoot back with my pistols, and the howls of them worthless critters when my bullets knocked splinters in their faces was music to my ears. There was a corral some distance behind the cabin with six hosses in it. To my surprise I seen one of em was a bobtailed roan the fellow was riding which I seen talking with Sue Pritchard and Jack Montgomery, and I wondered if them blame outlaws had captured him. But I warn't accomplishing much, shooting at them loopholes, and the sun dipped lower and I began to get mad. I decided to rush the cabin anyway unto hell with their darned buckshot, and I dismounted and stumped my toe right severe on a rock. It always did madden me to stump my toe, and I uttered some loud and profane remarks, and I reckon them scoundrels must have thunk I'd stopped some lead, the way they whooped. But just then I had inspiration. A big thick smoke was pouring out of the rock chimney so I knowed there was a big fire on the fireplace where they was cooking supper, and I was sure they weren't but one door in the cabin. So I'd taken up the rock which was about the size of an ordinary pig and throwed it at the chimney. Boys on Bear Creek is ashamed if they have to use more than one rock on a squirrel in a hundred foot tree across the creek, and I didn't miss. I hit her center and she buckled and come crashing down in a regular shower of rocks, and most of them fell down into the fireplace as I knowed by the way the sparks flew. I judged that the coals were scattered all over the floor, and the chimney hole was blocked so the smoke couldn't get out that way. Anyway, the smoke began to pour out of the winders and the ridge wires stopped shooting and started hollering. Somebody yelled, the floor's on fire. Throw that bucket of water on it. And somebody else shrieked, wait, you damn fool. That ain't water, it's whiskey, but he was too late, I heard the splash and then a most amazing flame sprung up and licked out of the winders and the fellas hollered louder than ever and yelled, let me out. I got smoke in my eyes. I'm choked into death. I left the thicket and ran to the door just as a man throwed it open and staggered out blind as a bat and cussing and shooting wild. I was afeard he'd hurt himself if he kept tearing around like that, so I'd taken his shotgun away from him and bent the barrel over his head to kinda keep him quiet and then I seen to my surprise that he was the fellow which rode the bobtail drone. I thunk how surprised Sue'd be to know a friend of hern was a cussed outlaw. I then went into the cabin which was so full of smoke and gunpowder fumes a man couldn't hardly see nothing. The walls and roof was on fire by now, and the midgets was tearing around with their eyes full of smoke trying to find the door, and one of em run head on into the wall and knocked herself stiff. I throwed him outside, and got hold of another to lead him out, and he cut me across the bosom with his bowie. I was so stung by this ingratitude that when I tossed him out to safety I maybe throwed him further than I aimed to, and it appears there was a stump which he hit his head on. But I couldn't help it being there, I then turned around and located the remaining three, which was fighting with each other evidently thinking they was fighting me. Just as I started for em a big log fell out of the roof and knocked two of em groggy and sought their clothes on fire, and a regular sheet of flame sprung up and burnt off most of my hair and whilst I was dazzled by it the surviving outlaw unpassed me out the door, leaving his smoking shirt in my hand, well, I dragged the other two out and stomped on em to put out the fire, and the way they hollered you'd have thought I was injuring em instead of saving their fool lives, shut up and tell me where the gold is, I ordered, and one of em gurgled, Ridgeways got it, I asked one of em was him and they all swore they wasn't, and I remembered the fellow which ran out to the cabin. So I looked around and seen him just leading a hoss out of the corral to ride off bareback, you stop. I roared, letting my voice out full, which I seldom does. The acorns rattled down out of the trees, and the tall grass bent flat, and the hoss ridgeway was fixing to mount got scared and jerked away from him and bolted, and the other hosses knocked the corral gate down and stampeded. Three or four of them ran over ridgeway before he could get out of the way. He jumped up and headed out to cross the flat on foot, wobbling some but going strong. 
I could have shot him easy but I was afeard he'd hid the gold somewheres, and if I killed him he couldn't tell me where. So I run and got my lariat and taken out after him on foot, because I figured he'd duck into the thick brush to get away. But when he seen I was overhauling him he made for the mountainside and began to climb a steep slope, I followed him, but before he was much more than halfway up he'd taken refuge on a ledge behind a dead tree and started shooting at me. I got behind a boulder about 75 foot below him, and asked him to surrender, like a gent, but his only reply was a direct slur on my ancestry and more bullets, one of which knocked off a sliver of rock which gouged my neck, this annoyed me so much that I pulled my pistols and started shooting back at him. But all I could hit was the tree, and the sun was going down and I was afeard if I didn't get him before dark he'd managed to sneak off. So I stood up, paying no attention to the slug he put in my shoulder, and swung my lariat. I always uses a 90 foot rope, I got no use for them little bitsy pieces of string most punches uses, I throwed my noose and looped the tree, and sot my feet solid and heaved, and tore the darn tree up by the roots. But them roots went so deep most of the ledge come along with them, and that started a landslide. The first thing I knowed here come the tree and ridgeway and several tons of loose rock and shale, gathering weight and speed as they come. It sounded like thunder rolling down the mountain and Ridgeway's screams was frightful to hear. I jumped out from behind the boulder intending to let the landslide split on me and grab him out as it went past me, but I stumbled and fell and that darn tree hit me behind the ear and the next thing I knowed I was travelling down the mountain with Ridgeway and the rest of the avalanche. It was very humiliating, I was right glad at the time, I recollect, that Miss Sue Pritchard wasn't near as near to witness this catastrophe. It's hard for a man to keep his dignity, I found when he's scootin' in a hell slew of trees and brush and rocks and dirt, and I become aware, too, that a snag had tore the seat out of my pants, which made me some despondent. This, I figured, is what a man gets for losing his self-control. I recollected another time or two when I'd exposed myself to the consequences by exerting my full strength, and I made me a couple of promises then and there, it's all right for a single young fella to go hellin' around and let the chips fall where they may but it's different with a man like me who was almost just the same as practically married. You got to look before you leap, was the way I reckoned it. A man's got to think of his wife and children, we brung up at the foot of the slope in a heap of boulders and shale, and I throwed a few hundred pounds of busted rocks off of me and riz up and shaken the blood out of my eyes and looked around for Ridgeway, I presently located a boot sticking out to the heap, and I laid hold onto it and hauled him out and he looked remarkable like a skint rabbit. About all the clothes he had left onto him beside his boots was his belt, and I seen a fat buckskin poke stuck under it. So I dragged it out, and about that time he sot up groggy and looked around dizzy and moaned feeble, Who the hell are you, Breckenridge Elkins, of Bear Creek, I said, and with all the men they is in the state of Nevada, he says weakly, I had to tangle with you. What you going to do, I think I'll turn you and your gang over to the sheriff, I says. I don't hold much with law we ain't never had none on Bear Creek but such coyotes as you all don't deserve no better, a hell of a right you got to talk about law. He said fiercely. After plotting with Badger McVeigh to rob old man Clements. That's all I done, what you mean? I demanded. Clements robbed McVeigh of this here dust, robbed hell. Says Ridgeway. McVeigh is the crookedest Gus that ever lived, only he ain't got the guts to commit robbery himself. Why? Clements is an honest miner, the old jackass, and he panned that they're dust up in the hills. He's been hiding for weeks, scared to try to get out of the country, we was hunting him too industrious, McVeigh put me up to committing robbery? I ejaculated, aghast, that's just what he did, declared Ridgeway, and I was so overcome by this perfidy that I was plump paralyzed. Before I could recover Ridgeway gave a convulsive flop and rolled over into the bushes and was gone in an instant. The next thing I knowed I heard horses running and I turned in time to see a bunch of men riding up on me. Old man Clements was with them, and I recognized the others as the fellas I stopped from chasing Soup Richard on the road below Red Cougar. I reached for a pistol, but Clements yelled, hold on. They're friends. He then jumped off and grabbed the poke out of my limp hand and waved it at them triumphantly. See that? He hollered. Didn't I tell you he was a friend? Didn't I tell you he come up here to bust up that gang? He got my gold back for me, just like I said he would. He then grabbed my hand and shaked it energetic, and says, These is the men I sent to Tomahawk for, to help me get my gold out. They got in my cave just a while after you left. They're prejudiced taken you, but, no, we ain't. Denied Yana Whiskers, which I now seen was wearing a deputy's badge. And he got off and shaken my hand heartily.
You didn't know we were special law officers, and I reckon it did look bad, six men chasing a woman. We thought you was an outlaw. We was pretty mad at you when we finally caught our hosses and headed back. But I began to wonder about you when we found them six disabled outlaws in the store at Red Cougar. Then when we got to Clement's cave, and found you befriended him, and had lit out on Ridgeway's trail, it looked still better for you, but I still thought maybe you was after that gold on your own account. But, of course, I see now I was all wrong, and I apologizes. Where's Ridgeway, he got away, I said, never mind, says Clements, pumping my hand again. Kirby here and his men has got Jeff Middleton and five more men in the jail at Red Cougar. McVeigh, the old hypocrite, taken to the hills when Kirby rode into town. And we got six more of Ridgeway's gang tied up over at Ridgeway's cabin or where it was till you burnt it down. They're sure a battered mob. It must have been an awful fight. You look like you've been through a tornado yourself. Come on with us and our prisoners to Tomahawk. I buys you a new suit of clothes, and we celebrates. I got to get a feller I left tied up in a tree down the gulch, I said. Jack Montgomery. He's at loco weed or something. He's crazy. They laughed hearty, and Kirby says, you got a great sense of humor, Elkins. We found him when we come up the gulch, and brung him on with us. He's tied up with the rest of them back there. You sure was slick, foolin' McVeigh into tellin' you where Clements was hidin', and foolin' that whole Ridgeway gang into thinkin' you aimed to rob Clements. Too bad you didn't know we was officers, so we could have worked together. But I got a laugh when I think how McVeigh thought he was jippin' you into stealin' for him, and all the time you was just studying how to rescue Clements and bust up Ridgeway's gang. Ho! 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 But I didn't I begun dizzily, because my head was swimming. You just made one mistake, says Kirby, and that was when you let slip where Clements was hiding, but I never told nobody but Soup Richard. I says wildly, many a good man has been nuked by a woman says Kirby tolerantly. We got the whole yarn from Montgomery. The minute you told her, she snuck out and called in two of Ridgeway's men and sent one of them for it to tell Buck where to find Clements, and she sent the other, which was Montgomery, to go along with you and lay you out before you could get there. She looked for the hills when he come into Red Cougar and I bet her and Ridgeway are streaking it over the mountains together right now. But that ain't your fault. You didn't know she was Buck Scal, the perfidity of women, gimme my hoss, I said groggily. I've been scorched and shot and cut and fell on by a avalanche, and my honest love has been betrayed. You sees before you the singed, skint and blood-soaked result of female treachery. Fate has dealt me the joker. My heart is busted and the seat is tore out of my pants. Get out of the way. I'm riding, where to? They asked, awed, anywhere, I bellas, just so it's far away from Red Cougar.